two, one, and we're live. Um, not really live, it's not streaming, but this will be recorded and available at law.mit.edu, um, where um, it's going to be magically uploaded when I hit stop recording to our YouTube station. So um, we're really happy tonight to be hosting our favorite group, Legal Hackers. Uh, and um, uh, I'm a, a member of Legal Hackers and co-chair of Boston Legal Hackers. Um, and also a scientist here at MIT Media Lab um, and blog at MIT.edu. And so we're happy to provide the physical location. And, um, and tonight's um, meetup is on a very critical topic, uh, uh, online dispute resolution, and, um, and a terrific deep dive into a very practical recent application um, that we're gonna learn more about. But um, I wanted to just introduce um, my co-organizer, um, Havel, who really has put this whole, um, uh, as a local organizer, really put this event together. I was hoping you can introduce yourself and say a few words and introduce our guests. Thanks, Pavel. Wonderful. Thank you, Daza. <laughs> thank you, everybody. So I am Pavel Vespalco. I'm one of the co-organizers of the chapter. I want to thank everybody who's here today uh, and who's going to watch this online. Obviously, you guys get the benefit of pizzas and uh, beverages, which mm -hmm. people <laughs> offline uh, are not going to get. And um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about online dispute resolution. This has been a very interesting area. Uh, there have been major developments, I wanna say in late 90s, early 2000s. Then it kind of quieted down, but lately this has been all the rage, I want to say. Uh, the European Union has actually established a single channel for all of the consumer claims that would go through online dispute resolution mechanisms, and this is actually mandatory. All the merchants who operate within the European Union have to include this link to a system that they have. So clearly this is something that has been at the forefront, and I personally have been involved uh, with a startup that does online consumer uh, arbitrations, and that has been a very interesting experience. So I want to welcome our guests, all the way from Australia, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, uh, so we have uh, our panel, and we have Madeline uh, Oldfield. Hello, everyone. Hi, Spanish. And we have uh, Donald Spiegel. Spiegel. There you go. Uh, do, uh, and uh, we have Diane. I don't know. Exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're going to talk to us about a dispute resolution pilot program, an online program that uh, they implemented in Victoria and that has been a success, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to hear more about the, how you guys came up with it, how you designed it, and how you worked with different stakeholders, including the government, obviously. Yes. And uh, what you guys have learned, which I hope has been a lot. Thanks. Man. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you for being here. No, thanks for inviting us, everyone. And I'm sure you're asking the same question that, that I did when, and Pavel did when I contacted him, and Daza did, is, what are a bunch of Australians doing here? What are they doing here? And um, look, I'm, I'm hopefully pleased to announce um, that we, uh, yes, it's true, g'day, all of those kind of cultural <laughs> connotations are there. Um, but I do need to say we're, we're here because we were very fortunate. We've just won the Project Management Institute, or PMI's, Global Project of the Year called the Project Management Excellence Award. And they award it to regions with projects under $100 million. Um, you know, there's an award for over $100 million, but uh, when you start to hear about how small and tight our budget was, hopefully it sort of makes it just that little bit more impressive. Um, what we've got today, uh, oh yeah, I'll pass, yep. Um, what we've got today, I do is just kind of give you a bit of a sense for those who haven't seen or heard much about what we've done. It's just to sort of uh, put on a bit of a, there we go, can you get the volume working there for me? Uh, care efficient and Justice. Cool. Well, that's up to the beginning so the folks online can hear. The mission of ECAP is to provide fair, efficient, and accessible justice. Um, that's part of what is in our legislation, but it is um, part of the ethos of this place. The ECAP experiment with online dispute resolution started back when we worked with the Department of Justice on the ECAP Criminal Justice uh, Review. In that review, it became um, clear that there was significant funding need. An online dispute resolution was put forward as something that needed to be looked at as a way of meeting that need. So there were several solutions to that. It brought to our attention the potential of online dispute resolution. And what 
the group you said was that you know it's really important to run the pilot first to evaluate it and then to run the trial. The VCAP pilot in online dispute resolution is a pilot program aimed at exploring whether there's a simple, efficient and effective way to resolve small civil claims disputes at VCAP. We had a hypothesis out there that said that if VCAP was to introduce online dispute resolution, then the Victorian community will experience improved access to justice. Um, and I guess the reason we decided to attempt to prove or disprove this hypothesis um, is because this is not an IT project. The last thing you want to do is put in a system that no one's going to use. You need to understand the why. So we brought everybody in and we created this space um, to be able to do that. We saw, well, first the uh, fantastic uh, business process mapping uh, that has been done that identified all of the pain points as they seem to be called. Uh, it identified clearly where the potential lines for any of the other functions. And then we were shown the prototype that Mobile takes or then develop, which will be part of the a handful of live cases. Modron has joined the project to take the broad solution that we have and figure out where VCAT will be able to get the biggest advantages from applying technology to the process. We have developed a series of personas that represent everyday Victorians with everyday business problems, and we've taken up the role of those people in a dispute situation, trying to work together with VCAT's help to sort things out. One of the things that we've had really strong and positive feedback about our tool is that much of it is second nature to people already. We're focused on video chat and text chat and the kinds of things that you're doing with your friends and family already, but applying them towards um, situations that are, that are kind of scary. So in some ways, technology can give people a soft landing into circumstances that are otherwise um, quite daunting for them. Understanding what are the cultural factors, what are the skills and capability, what's the mindset and behaviours people need to adopt has actually been really helpful for us. We all operate in a world um, that's very set up to service physical infrastructure. You know, we, we need healing rooms, we need um, lizards, we need applications and what online dispute resolution does is enable us to just reimagine all of that. The results that we are beginning to see from this work are so compelling and so clear cut that even for the most cautious of people, there's a new level of openness to exploring the applications of technology in this space even further. The department thinks there is real potential in ODR and across the small claims, but potentially also in other types of claims of VCAT, more minor criminal matters, and potentially even larger uh, civil matters. The goal now for me is to take this as far as we can take it in terms of testing the pilot and in terms of gathering as, as much rich evidence as we can to support a business case so that we can actually put this service that we're building uh, into production. One of the questions in our last survey was whether or not if online dispute resolution was available, would people embrace it? More than 70% of people identified that they would be interested in utilising services provided in that manner, their capacity to do more and more um, utilising online dispute resolution technology is clearly um, the way of the future. So, it seems sort of natural that we'd start at that point in the life cycle, right? But we thought, look, we're going to come all the way to America, we're going to win an award, you guys are going to, um, you know, leave your homes and your families for a night out at the Boston Legal Hackers, we've got to give you some really juicy, juicy goss. So what I thought we would do is try something a bit differently. Um, so the people that you've got on this panel today and in front of you, members of our team, bring a really unique perspective. So my name's Madeline Oldfield, I was the Program Director for the pilot that you see. Uh, in that video there. Um, to my right is uh, Donald Spiegel. He is an um, honorary senior fellow at sort of the Melbourne Law School. 
Uh, Donald is also, as you can see from the video, the former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Justice. And behind Donald's back, everyone used to refer to him as Mr. Civil Justice, right? So that's what we would call him, uh, Civil Justice in Victoria. So it's a real honour to have Donna, Donald here with us. Um, we also have Diana from uh, ThoughtWorks. And Diana is the global head of, of uh, service design for technical operations. It's a really long title, actually. We've got to find something a bit cooler and sexier. It was just easier for me to explain. But the, um, the, the view of having a strategic designer on our team was to really help us sort of challenge that ecosystem question. And I'm just going to sort of go in line. We've got Shireen ready to my left over here. Shireen is, uh, was our resident lawyer. So uh, we knew that we wouldn't be able to do this just by kind of making it up with a few project management hacks and a few cool post-it notes. We actually needed someone that was going to have to liaise with our members um, and help explain what it is that we were doing. We've got Chelsea Bates, who not only pulled together the ThoughtWorks team, is also one of our resident experts in Agile at scale, if anyone's interested in those uh, ways of working in tech. Liz Griffiths, sort of my guru of everything, uh, but particularly strong as our viability lead. Um, I had this wonderful idea once upon a time that I would um, second Liz in from the Department of Treasury and Finance. And the reason I did that is because I knew somewhere up the chain, the Department of Treasury and Finance would get our business case and I wanted the person that was reviewing it on my project team. So uh, that's why Liz joins us today. She was silly enough to say yes, so thanks for that Liz. And we've also got Beatrice Collins, uh, another silly seconding in who uh, listened to me long enough um, to second Beatrice in from uh, Department of Justice where Beatrice specialises in agile procurement and agile contracting. And agile not just by, you know, let's just go faster, right? There's some real science and some real kind of legal hacks involved in just the contracting side alone. So if you certainly hit Beatrice up for some questions afterwards, we'll show you a bit of what we did. Um, so like I said, the real story didn't actually start at that point at the video, right? It started a few years before that. So rather than hear from me, I thought I'd hand over to Donald Spiegel, who's going to uh, give us a real kind of a couple of great insights into what was going on in Department of Justice land. So over to you, Donald. Well, uh, thanks, Madeline. And uh, don't believe all that Madeline says, at least about me. <laughs> so uh, I want to start with uh, the policy background. Um, Victoria elected a Labor government in 2014, late 2014, and in that government's platform was a commitment to undertake an inquiry into access to justice. So we provided advice to the Attorney General about how this could be done. In the end, he decided that he wanted the Department of Justice and Regulation, as it was then known, to conduct that inquiry. Now, the terms of reference were quite specific. Um, there were certain topics nominated. Uh, by definition, they excluded some other topics. And the topic uh, that was relevant here was term of reference four, which was to examine potential reform to the jurisdiction, practices, and procedures of VCAT to make the resolution of small civil claims as simple, affordable, and efficient as possible. So those were our writing instructions. Now, a little background for you. What is a small civil claim? In 2015, it was anything up to 10,000 Australian dollars concerning a transaction governed by the Australian Consumer Law. Um, in US dollars at today's exchange rate, that's about 6,800. The previous uh, right of centre government had increased fees payable by litigants uh, to bring a small claim from $39 to $132, very large proportionate increase. And as a consequence, the number of small claims lodged with VCAT fell very substantially down from around 7,700 in 2012-13 to approximately 5,800 in 2014-15. Now by way of comparison and relevant to this question that I'm going to demand, the frontline triage service provided by Consumer Affairs Victoria in the Department of Justice uh, had almost 3 million hits on its website in 14-15. It answered 78,000 phone calls and responded to 50,000 email and other online inquiries. In July 16, the current government reduced the standard fee for lodging a small claim to $61.50 for claims under 3,000 or $204.90 for claims between $3,000 and $15,000. Various stakeholders told the review that resolution of small claims at VCAT was too complex. So yes, the fees have been reduced, but 
the processes were too complex, and that in particular disadvantaged and regional Victorians continued to experience barriers to accessing justice. It's worth pointing out that VGAT did uh, introduce an online application form in 2015, but the VGAT submission to the review itself recognised that VCAT had not kept pace with technological developments and that by investing in technology there was the potential to increase access to justice and become more efficient. However, and we'll come back to this point, VCAT thought that it faced both legislative constraints and IT constraints. Let me now say something about the policy analysis for the review. So I uh, introduced this notion to my team of hypothesis-driven uh, project management. Um, to a bunch of lawyers, uh, fairly traditionally educated, um, this was often, in fact, I think almost invariably new. Um, it is, of course, the methodology that major consulting firms and many other consulting firms use. So, uh, the next um, I did have an hypothesis uh, for this term of reference, and that hypothesis came from a 2015 conference presentation um, that I had attended. The conference was convened by the Australasian Institute for Judicial Administration, and the presentation was given by Professor Richard Siskin. He's a name to people in this room, I would assume. Uh, and I think it's fair to say he's the leading authority on how technology interacts with the law, uh, the book that was highlighted in this 2015 presentation was Tomorrow's Lawyers, An Introduction to Your Future, if you're a lawyer, not necessarily happy reading. <laughs> um, and of course, he's now just published a book uh, called Online Courts and the Future of Justice. That presentation introduced me also to the online dispute resolution systems that were underway in British Columbia system called the Civil Resolution Tribunal, and also the Netherlands Reprisal System for Family Law Disputes. Now, as um, the professor at the Kennedy School once said to me, if you see a good idea, steal it. <laughs> uh, and that's what I intended to do. So um, it's one thing to have an hypothesis, um, you need an argument to support that. So what is that argument? The, uh, starting point here probably is a major report on access to justice from 2014 done by our Federal Government's Productivity Commission, which despite the name is actually the Federal Government's leading independent policy advisory body um, and it deals with all kinds of difficult policy issues where government wants a completely independent and really robust analysis. And the 2014 report on access to justice from the PC had mentioned ODR and mentioned the potential of ODR. On top of that, as I've already indicated, submissions to our review advocated better use of online technologies and ODR in particular to improve access to justice. Equally, however, there was concern for litigants who, for whatever reason, would be unable to use ODR for online services. So the review met with Richard Suskind and key people, uh, Shannon Salter from British Columbia and also the Netherlands. What they all said was that there is a very strong theoretical argument for ODR. It's an argument that revolves around the idea of any time, any place dispute resolution. It creates flexibility, it creates convenience, and it's especially good for people in regional areas who would otherwise have to travel quite substantial distances to a tribunal of hearing. It's good for those with poor English because they can have someone sitting with them helping them. And it's good for people with certain types of disability. The theory also says that costs will be reduced. Um, and in some ways, the most important costs are not the direct costs of tribunal fees, they're the indirect costs, taking a half a day or even a whole day off work to attend a tribunal hearing, especially if you live quite some distance from the locale of a tribunal hearing. Um, and also, of course, the travel time is part of that. And then finally, there was a point about greater transparency. Now, I think this is, in truth, independent of ODR, but 
if one pursues ODR, it's pretty natural to do certain things to increase transparency, such as providing online information about rules and procedures, providing a searchable database of decisions, um, and perhaps online broadcasting of proceedings. So then let me come to the recommendation in our report uh, for a new ODR system for small civil claims at VCAP. Importantly, the recommendation says that a pilot should be run um, and that broader introduction of ODR in Victoria should be subject to rigorous evaluation of that pilot, including benefit cost analysis. The recommendation also emphasised that existing traditional forms of dispute resolution should be maintained so that that option continues to exist and we don't create a new digital divide. It recommended a tiered fee structure and then finally, uh, and this goes to the idea of dispute prevention, it recommended analysis of de-identified data gathered through an ODR system for uh, regulatory purposes. In other words, Consumer Affairs Victoria could understand better what were the sources of these disputes. When we came to implementation, uh, it's important to mention that uh, an interdepartmental committee had overseen uh, the production of this uh, report and review and what was there was quite powerfully shaped uh, by that committee. Um, in particular, that committee recommended an ODR advisory panel comprising <coughs> all of the relevant stakeholders. Um, and I think Madeline will say more about that because that turned out to be a really important part of this project. <coughs> I mentioned before this question of legislation. Uh, I had thought actually that the VCAT legislation would need amendment in order for us to use ODR. As it turned out, <coughs> that assumption was wrong. Uh, and it was possible to run this pilot with live cases without any legislative change. And finally, uh, a point which has already been highlighted, um, often in implementation of new online services, there's this question about whether they should be opt-in or opt-out. Uh, the view that uh, was taken was that, as the president of VCAT said in the video, um, the demand for online services is such that you don't have to worry about people not using it. Um, you can have an opt-in system and people will flock to it. So, over to Madeline. All right. <clears throat> so, so Donald makes it sound very structured and, and, and that you know, we're ready to go. So I get this problem space from the then sort of former CEO, Tony Green. He said, oh, hey Madeline. Uh, you know something about projects, you know something about running projects. So uh, we've got about $800,000 to plan for this pilot um, and a recommendation that says we, says we need to plan for an ODR. By the way, you'll have to engage with 26 senior executive stakeholders across the justice sector on one committee. You can do that, all right? By the way, uh, time's ticking. Uh, we'll need something certainly by the end of the financial year. And uh, at all of sort of 37 and a half weeks pregnant, I sort of thought to myself, gosh, time's running out. There's, there's about nine months left to go. Um, get a, better get back to work quickly. So I took my three months off, I came back, um, and I realised a few things. I had read the report when I was on uh, mat leave, as one does, because that makes for great reading when you've got a newborn. Um, and it also made me realise that there were some interesting insights that perhaps um, weren't quite evidence-driven enough. There, were, there was a lot of qualitative data that I had in front of me, you know, the expectation that it would be a really good thing, but I couldn't see evidence as to why. So when I inherited it and said, put it in an ODR solution, I couldn't quite understand why. So I started by asking lots of questions. Why ODR? What value does ODR bring? We didn't guess at it. So we started with that construct, concept at the end in mind. And I worked backwards from a state that said we would have to form a really sort of structured hypothesis, right? And, and our goal and aim on this project was to prove or disprove this statement. And to do that, we needed evidence, we needed data, and we needed great minds and experts across a whole variety of domains and disciplines. Um, the, the other thing we did that I think was really important in, in defining that and being able to measure our success was we were really clear about defining what access to justice meant for our context. Got to remember, right? I mean, we're a tribunal. At the time, it was a tribunal in Victoria. We, we couldn't solve the ecosystem problems, but it didn't mean 
assume that we shouldn't understand them. And by understanding the entire ecosystem and the problem space that we were operating in, we could then understand the bits that we could control. And that's what I think also made us effective. So when we defined access to justice, it really we went back to sort of the federal government report that was written a few years ago, and there were five key principles, if you will, um, appropriateness, accessibility, equity, efficiency, and effectiveness. And the fact that I still remember these, you know, 12 months later tells you that they are very much seared into my brain for a very long time. Um, and what we attempted to do throughout the whole pilot is, is, is measure success against those key five criteria, right? So it wasn't an evaluation that happened at the end of the pilot, it was something that happened at every step of the way. The other thing I think that helped us in shaping this hypothesis and ensuring with our stakeholders that we were there to prove or disprove is it just kind of freed up the space a bit more. We, didn't, we weren't forcing anyone into online dispute resolution. We were working together to see whether it would be successful. And that human element really drove our entire thinking around it, which is why we engaged in human-centered design and other things. So I thought what I'd do is share a bit of a snapshot of our problem space, because the numbers are quite fascinating. So, our research showed, using Law of New South Wales survey data and reports, that around 630,000 Victorians had a legitimate consumer legal problem in a 12 month window. Pretty big number. We thought it was important to understand that number. And the construct we talk about is supply and demand. And Liz, what's your kind of insight on it? Did you have something on your... Um, so we kind of thought about this, it was pretty easy to work out who was coming, how many, who and why people who would come into BCAT. We had that data. We had a bit of insight into um, that for other um, tribunals and courts in Victoria. Um, but what we needed to find out is who's not coming and why are they not coming? Because if we're gonna improve access to justice, we need to shift that dial. Um, and so I think in looking at sort of a supply and demand element, what we uh, realised was that, and, and Maddie's already said it, and Donald's kind of um, pointed to it as well, this is really an ecosystem problem. And so having the 25 senior stakeholders from across the civil justice system ended up being an incredible opportunity to say, this isn't just BCAT's problem to solve, this is all of us need to work together to solve this. Um, but BCAT is looking at this specific part and what we learn, we will share with everyone so everyone can kind of adopt it. Everyone working together in the justice sector, one big happy 26 group uh, advisory board. So that was great. Now, the next slide's the goodie, right? So of that 630,000, does anyone want to take a guess roughly about how much our particular tribunal, how many cases they would hear in that same 12 month window? 10,000. One taker, anyone else? 30,000. 30,000, okay. And that's from the numbers folks, right? Yeah, 2,000. Any other takers, any other takers before the big reveal? Roughly 7,100 cases. Now, there was at that very, and we used to sort of conceptualize it, you'll probably see it on the video. It was a bit like a, you know, a, a leaky tap, right? So you turn the tap on at 630,000 and it poured, legitimate consumer unmet demand into a leaky bucket, and people would drop out at every stage, right? Lots of holes in the ecosystem, lots of challenges. Back at the very, very beginning, before anything even started, one in four would drop out. And as you would go through, and people would realise the complexity, they realise the sort of mental load, they would also realise that you're only really ever going to get, on average, 30% of your original claim. Most people decided, kind of wasn't for me. Now, that was actually a really scary thought for me, sort of as an individual, as a Victorian, but also someone who wants to contribute to civil justice, you know, in our state, because that means there's a heck of a lot of people not accessing their civil justice rights. And that really drove our team, I guess, as the philosophy and the purpose behind what we were doing. It was never gonna be an IT project. I worked at IBM for many years and I still didn't run IT projects there. I wasn't gonna start now. So this was always about the people and improving things for our community. So, Seen the numbers, you've seen the research. Let's do it. Right, no more talking, no more stats, no more hypothesis. We've got to do this thing. And we had three months to build a prototype, working, which we called our MVP. And as a sort of 
management consultant over the years, I've, I've become a bit of a magpie, a bit of a shiny new thing I can steal and put in my toolkit, I, I tend to use, right? And so uh, I just want everyone to brace themselves. You're about to hear every possible buzzword that you've ever heard in one nice, neat little slide. All right, so it actually started, I, I just come off a banking client um, working with a very elusive tier one management consulting company that we certainly couldn't afford for this project. So I was very happy to work with them because I learned a little bit about IDEO.org's field guide, which is a fantastic research, a resource if anyone's interested, 150 pages of pure gold. It's a great problem solving, um, call it a method, an approach, um, kind of an inspiration for us. And what it effectively did, I, I used this to architect um, our human-centred design model where we put humans at the centre of what we do. That's what they call the desirability lens. And we asked ourselves the question, you know, what do people want and need? We then went and asked, what viability, right? And that's Liz's sort of function. What can we afford for what risk? And that's where Shireen's fantastic policy work, um, you know, working out, as Donald mentioned, that we didn't actually need to change the legislation. Everyone thought we did. Thanks to Shireen. Saved me a heck of a lot of work and a heck of a lot of effort and got us to our three months in the end. And then feasibility. Um, now, I'm sorry for anyone who's watching this or in the room that has worked with IDEO and I'm about to bastardise their beautiful 150 page field guide. Um, because feasibility to me, I, I sort of tweak the meaning a little bit. Um, often it just focuses on technology. My experience has taught me that you don't just want to focus on tech feasibility, the, the capabilities of the technology. Um, someone who's worked a lot in organisational change management, there's three key things you've got to look at, right? Simply, piece, people, process, tech. So I looked at building up the capabilities around online dispute resolution beyond just the technology. What are the people capabilities that are needed to support it? What are the processes we need to redesign around it? You know, what are the organisational functions? So that's why we've used that human-centred design model. We then, I mean, we're a government, right? We're a government entity. We can't just like walk around with a couple of post-it notes, even though we did that for a while. We did have to put some governance and structure in. So um, as a project management professional, PMP is part of the Project Management Institute. They have their own field guide, right? It's called the PMI PMBOK. It's riveting reading, I, I thoroughly recommend it. And they have a whole bunch of processes and phases that you can get some structure in your initiative, right? Particularly when you're solving a problem that's very nebulous and we're not quite sure where it falls in the world. So having that as a bit of a central guide actually built trust with our stakeholders. And that happened again because when you're in this really uncertain space and people are uncomfortable, putting some structure around what you're doing actually builds confidence and trust with your stakeholders. Even though I couldn't tell them what they were going to get, I couldn't tell them, I could tell them when they were going to get it, and I could tell them how much we had because the Attorney General told us exactly how much we had, which is the 800,000, but I couldn't actually define what they were going to get for that money until we worked through this process that that Diana's going to talk to you in a bit. So that was my governance and structure. As for delivery, here come the buzzwords. I've given you PMP, I've given you human centred design, we'll play bingo at the end of this. I'll give you agile. So we use agile at scale ways of working in government. We had teams. We had, you know, whatever you want to call them, squads or whatever you want to call them. We had cross-functional teams made up of people with technology skills and capability, legal and policy skills and capability, um, you know, number crunching, data crunching, org change, procurement, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Chelsea, you know, one of the things I really appreciated when Chelsea was with us is the insights that she gave us, you know, in terms of Agile. So, you know, what was probably your kind of key love of Agile in, in watching us do this? What were the sorts of things that, that you really resonated with you. Certainly the challenge of everyone um, with the one thing I was thinking about was about often focusing on your team on the same page. So that it's slightly different than saying they can do everything with the same thing again. So that was a really important thing we were really trying to yeah. get that. Yeah. So we didn't just talk about it, we didn't put it in reports. We actually used this construct of show don't tell. Right? So everything we did was tangible, it was visible, it was transparent, we improved collaboration. So there's some of the techniques that we used. Um, the other thing we did was Lean Six Sigma. Oh, another one, right? So Lean Six Sigma, if anyone's heard of that, is a way of understanding your value stream, right? All of the steps in your process, if you want to call it that, all of the things that, that operate um, in order to input into the next step and the next step. And again, Dan will talk about more about what that looked like. The reason we did that is we needed to be able to explain to people in that ecosystem challenge is what bits the tribunal could, could impact and, and what could happen there, but also what happened upstream and what could happen downstream. There was one line uh, that I thought was really fascinating. Um, 
you know, uh, from one of our uh, illustrious sort of um, advisory panel members. They said, don't, don't we change the system? Don't remove that barrier that was designed that way on purpose. We want to keep the barriers there. Don't open the floodgates. And so what I heard as I moved with these things is I was like, challenge, how do I protect the floodgates from breaking the rest of the ecosystem, right? Because to be fair, you know, it is a tribunal. We still we need to have some access to justice, right? We just want it to be better and improved. So through the Lean Six Sigma method, um, and we had a strategic partner, John Adamak, help us with that. Um, we built a robot, basically, if anyone's heard of automation, we built a little, we call it the POC bot, proof of concept bot. And what we attempted to do was sort of drag in more and more volumes of claims. And instead of having people manually typing and processing, we just got the robot to do it, right? We didn't build complex system integration and APIs and web services. We used a pretty simple, straightforward bot on a laptop that ran in the background. I think from, from um, memory, wait, no, it doesn't even have to be memory, I think I wrote it down somewhere. I think, uh, I think what ended up happening was, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it was um, 40 applications the robot could do in roughly 10 seconds, as opposed to 40 applications in 10 minutes by a human. That was a huge time saving, but again, if you're moving from 7,100 rough claims a year, somewhere in the vicinity of hundreds of thousands, to meet that 630,000 and the gap in unmet demand, we had to do something that's huge. And this week we didn't have a lot of money. So the last thing I'll throw to you, and I think it's really important, to particularly whether you're working in government or even in corporate entities, right? The construct of sourcing capability. One of the things I've learned again <coughs> professionally and, and working in government is you don't have all the skills at your disposal, right? Not everyone can do everything. You have to partner with people. And ideally, partnering with people that are, that are better than you and, and, and have more knowledge is absolutely the right way to go. Um, you know, and, and we talked about agile procurement before. So, you know, Beatrice, I mean, you did a lot with sort of the procurement space. I'm sorry to make Zaza kind of keep hitting his chair. He's giving me, he's giving me greasies from the front row. But, you know, Beatrice, I'm just curious as to your kind of perspective on sort of sourcing capability and, and what you would sort of say is the key take out with that. Uh, so the key takeout for me was definitely that uh, whenever you uh, try to source capabilities from outside your organization, uh, you need to align the contractual, the sourcing, the contractual um, um, management to the uh, project. So, you know, when you do agile, you create a certain velocity, which means that you need to onboard capabilities and offboard them as requirements emerge or as you realize that you've taken a board that's going nowhere. Uh, Non-contractual relationship, what is very important is predictability. Otherwise, no one wants to work with you. They're not quite sure they're going to get paid at the end of their work. Uh, and in agile procurement, you create that contractual predictability through instead of uh, centering the contract around requirement, you center it around how you're going to work and how uh, suppliers uh, in, that are um, contracted with you through a contract they feel are going to be onboarded and offboarded. So I think that's the key takeaway mm. for me. Mm. Yeah. We're, giving you, we're giving you our best stuff, right? So this is, this is the, the key kind of nugget. And frankly, because of our ability to source capability quickly, right? I don't just mean tech capability, tech capability, people capability, etc. We were able to scan the globe. We ran an international procurement system. We got every major vendor you would expect to see, and some big names, which I will not repeat, obviously, commercial confidence, but um, the ones you would expect to see were obviously participating. It was pretty exciting. We were trying something for the third time. But I gave them a challenge. And the challenge was this. So all those kind of pop pink post-it notes on the wall, pain points, I said, right, vendors, these are our pain points. The winner is the one who can build me a working prototype in four weeks, to address as many of those pain points as you can see as possible. I'm gonna run a series of experiments to test and see whether or not we can improve access to justice by removing those pain points. That's our aim. By the way, you have to run the pilot for roughly three months. Total tech cost, $100,000. We got some really creative insights by doing that, right? And as it turns out, um, we ended up partnering with, and again, unwisely, of course, an Australian startup, their name is Mojo, you saw them in the video, um, because we really liked the way that they put humans at the centre of all of their design work. 
They've partnered with the Mediation Group, our sort of mediation institute in Australia, and really co-designed their entire software. So as a platform, it was very intuitive, it understood the needs of our members, um, and the other great takeaway, I think, is when I sort of stacked up all of the options for our members, who are our, you know, the judges, and I said, right, I'm not gonna choose. You're gonna use it, you're gonna choose. Which one do you want? The members looked at it, they sort of discussed, as they do very deeply together. Shereen was caretaking everyone then. And I came back and I said, we want the cool, sexy looking platform. <laughs> and I went, it's all yours. And so that was also one of our decision points, right? How desirable was it? We could afford it, like I said, 100,000 but four weeks, that was the risk. And we had the tech capability there and the people around us to support the implementation. We backed the business, we saw staff that would normally be in that court administration, they came into the pilot and they were, we were ready to run it. Before we could run it, we had a little bit more work to do. So now I'm gonna hand to Diana to tell you how we got to that next layer of detail. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so the challenge is, so we've got a very large space, is how do you work out what to do and how to finish up? And so what we need to do is to pull all of that information together and create a, um, a picture. And so we can understand where some of those pain points um, that people have been referring to, where are they? And so it's really important that we see it from the citizens or from the customer's point of view. And so the language that we're using, we need to make sure that the information that we're pulling through, from a first, first point of view, is to look at him from the him point of view, so that person, that human, the, the person who had an issue in the first place, and what did they do with it. So the approach we've taken is a service design approach. Now service design is where you understand the service issue, but it's still driven by that customer experience point. So what I want to show you is a bit the wall that we created to actually create that big picture, which pulled together a lot of the, the data that Nick was talking about, and later on, later on I was talking about that, and, and we, we presented it uh, in the, from the perspective of the, the platform. The platform, sorry. Yeah. Our applicants and our respondents, right? The two parties involved. So that's interesting around the language itself. Um, so this is the wall, and it was roughly probably about half this wall that we're seeing on the left here. It's around I think about five, six metres long, mm -hmm. or 26 feet, something like that. Um, don't worry. And so what we have on here, and I'll probably, it's probably the easiest, one of the easier things for me to just walk through some of the key things. The first thing we did was understand the person who had experienced a problem in the first place, we mapped them first. And they are in that second line, in that light pink view. So we started over there and continued. <coughs> we sort of said, what happened to them first? Where do, where do the challenges come from? And so we mapped them first. And so we didn't map it straight on the wall, we mapped them on a table, because it, it takes a while to understand. But we had the people around who really knew what that experience was like. So sometimes we use the actual people who are experienced with it, but, but in this case, what we were doing was having insights from, from interviews and from what people knew really happened. So we would say, what is that experience like? And then the second thing we did, we mapped through is the other person. So that they are bringing an actual event. It here is light blue. So we can see that there's a gap here because they don't know about it until we actually look through it. And so you can see that. And that's because it's the most important thing for us, is understand what it's like and what's it actually experience for the people who are involved. And then what we overlay is these hot pink ones here. I'm not sure if you want to show some of the colours. Um, these are called pain points. And these pain points are from, from up here. And then there's a few pain points down here. You can think, see the person who has the, the, the issue in the first place, has a lot more pain as they try and bring that action, whatever that is. Now this is going through a number of different departments. This is not all just a VCAT thing. So it's really their whole experience. And so they need to go from department to department. And you can see there's a massive cluster of pain here. And then some of those things about take too long, I don't understand, or whatever it is. And, um, and so what we're doing is writing those down. They're, they're not made up, so they're from the research that we've done, so it's evidence-based. It's really important. So there's time flowing that way? It is, yeah. Okay. This is over time, yeah. So then when we do something like um, a value spend map, which does measure time, we can also put that time from there. But the initial thing to understand the experience in the border, so it is flows over time, right through to resolution, hopefully, of some sort. But what's interesting is when we start to also put in here dropout points, 
they do all the writing that they compare. So people compare really, very, very rarely. And so what we try to do is put some numbers so it's a volume, that gives you the sense of the size. So what's important is the most size volume is where they have the most. So that's, um, so we had people, and then we've got that, we have some um, metrics around volume, that, that's useful to have in there. But also down here, as we're doing it, we also get some ideas. This is actually part of the process, we go, what are the things we could do? And then also right down the very bottom, we've actually got the projects that are actually in flight that are trying to improve. So this is what's actually happening. And you can see there's a bit of a correlation. Lots of change, lots of attempts to address it. So, and so that's your service briefing. And what we've also got on here is there is the actual form. So what we're trying to do is to really understand um, and uh, for everyone to share as a team what their experience is like. So you can say, oh, there's actually lots of forms. And if you started to look at the data that's been collected, oh, the same stuff's been collected over and over again. So, so you start to see, you get a bit of a picture as a team, you go, maybe we could get to collect it once. So, so this, so, but, but what, but it takes actually a couple of weeks to really build this picture using the data and actually do each meeting. So, three members came past and we talk it through and they gave us a lot of this information about how, where people were, what challenges people had in the first phase. So, the idea is to go through it several times and it's something that will stay up for the lifetime of the project. So, it's not something that goes away. And then you sort of say, well, how do we start to improve things? So, we start to improve things. So, in this case, we were looking at the online. Um, dispute resolution for the module system. And so we started to put in here, you can see these are the pictures from the module system that were mentioned. And you can see they're right at the very end of the process. They don't have any impact here. Now, maybe there is something, because quite often you just, this is, this is upstream. And so an idea of what you want to do is not people coming into the process in the first place, perhaps. So typically everything is going upstream, you know, to the inventories and downstream. But you don't know, so you also you make a choice about where to start. And so the issues down downstream, so there are challenges down here, for sure. And so it is also something that is always worth trying. So this is what you experiment. You do something, it changes it. And so this, you pick this one picture and you start to evolve it. Now at the very top, you've got your broad phases, your broad goals. Typically these don't change. They're not revolutionizing. Now sometimes they do, but these things don't, don't change very much. But there's a lot you can do through this piece of enterprise. I don't know whether people are interested in this, but one of the reasons we started down here, as I mentioned, we uh, use desirability, viability, and feasibility to, to shape um, how we think of it. <coughs> and because of all the work that was happening here, and also because of the fact that we couldn't control things at the very front, it didn't really make sense to focus there. There was already a whole bunch of things that were going to hopefully improve the experience upstream, um, which is why we decided to tackle down there. So, didn't have to, but it's just a way of, I guess, shaping, as Mary mentioned, mm. um, what's important and where to focus on so it doesn't get too crowded and too close for each other. Yeah, that's true. And, and but the, the thing is, it's a big picture. So, yeah. so you, the question is going to be, how do you make the decision? Now, some things, to, to, to some extent, that decision has already been made. So there's a hypothesis established, and you want to go down that's fine. But it's still useful to, um, to get some context of the mm. ecosystem so that you actually get ready to understand what's the impact. If you don't do that phase, how do we know what impact it's going to have? And so it helps everyone get onto the, virtually onto the same page, I guess, for a good page. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a common artifact for everyone to look at it and have a common sense of it. So that's, um, so that's the wall, and you'll see that sort of in every house, but it's just going to be there in all places. And the challenge is going to be, as I said before, how do you start, uh, like how do you find the right story to tell from which person? So you start off with a few scenarios to try and understand, but it needs to come from actual so what actually happens? So it's a, you know, so that's the one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> and, and honestly, it was quite possibly the best tool we had. Um, I mean, the modern platform, of course, was, was quite useful as well. But in yeah. terms of stakeholder engagement and change management, yeah. this was the this was the money this was the money activity, and this was yeah. all in, all in all about thirteen days worth of effort. Yeah. Um, and it was multiple iterations for Diana and the team by the end of it were just broken humans. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't extrovert anymore, but you can imagine, I mean, we had hundreds of people walk through and hundreds of people add a new report, a new bit of data, and no one had ever scoped an ecosystem like this for this type of 
plane. And I think that's also what made it very unique. As much as the technology was really great too, understand this picture, we had a list of every experiment that we wanted to run, and therefore we had a, in Agile term, what's known as a product backlog. We could prioritise it based on desirability, viability, feasibility, so that as soon as our friends in the uh, Department of Treasury and Department of Justice gave us the green light through funding or whatever, we knew exactly how much we could go for. So if they gave us, for example, $5 million, we could do this much. Yeah, another five, this much, and so on and so on and so forth. So online dispute resolution is a construct like anything else. It's a, and, and any project, any sort of my sort of philosophy on project management, and I must sound like a bit of a fraud because we've just won the project management award, but I actually don't know if I believe in projects anymore. And I say that because it should be about continuous improvement. I, I believe this sort of stuff, this, an ecosystem is alive, which means that even when you think you've solved the problem, you can get better and you can improve more. I, I think I just, I just want to echo that. I think that's a really, really important point. Is we don't find a project experience doesn't start and stop, and that improvement and, and we always need to be zero to challenging ourselves all the time. Yeah. And I think that there's just a couple of rules I want to catch and share yeah, yeah, yeah. around the risk of thinking. One of them is continue to question. So it's, it's always it's never stopped. It's just always question why, whatever it is. So so and keep keep asking that even if you think it's working well. Why is it working well? You know, like never give up, never stop asking those questions. I think we're always so broader than we think with the other things. So, like, you tend to really go narrow and go, we just want to do this thing. But what you do is you miss such an opportunity to go so broad. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And I think real stories from real people. You don't, um, you know, I was kind of, I really wanted to sort of think, I didn't know what the, the legal terms were. And then as you literally say, I think it's more important that we keep um, humanizing our language. Yep. And remember about the people actually and their actual experience, and make sure we change partners' language and really understand that. And I think getting really good at hearing everything about that, mm -hmm. but not just that, but all the data around it, so the evidence that drives it, so it's real. Nothing is guessed. All of our assumptions are written and challenged, and that we continue to drive it forward. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think probably another one is probably along that MVP, which is that idea of minimal viable product. The minimum. What's the smallest thing we can change? And then see what happens. That probably needs data yeah. so that we understand and are ready for that change. So I think that's the, that's the useful rule of it when yeah. you think about these things. I mean, you've got to get some, you've got to get some runs on the board, right? Like you can't tackle something as big as this and eat the elephant and do everything and then it just kind of collapses, right? I mean, the UK is a really good case study for that. They've spent you know, over a billion pounds on you know a whole bunch of court automation. And I hope Richard Susskind is not going to watch this, but I'm sure he can tell you that there's uh, some work to be done there. You know, our, our pilot example, like I said, spending the sort of money that we, we did very, very sort of small amounts on planning for the pilot and having a working prototype um, really demonstrates that you can do things in quick, agile, nimble ways and deliver value sooner to your community. So don't be afraid. I mean, I, I have to be fair, I pretty much called on every you know professional favour in, in the book of anyone I've worked in the last 20 years. So thank you, Chelsea, for that. Really appreciate that. And Dana and others. So, um, but, for all of our, my you know, A personality types who just want to get to the end bit, let me give you some stats. <laughs> and like I said, show don't tell. So all of the stuff that I talked about, all the buzzwords, ended up with actual data, actual experiences, qualitative and quantitative. And as I said, that was out some rules, that's a good thing. So if we're ready, recap. 800,000 as our max budget to plan for the pilot and the, for the technology to run for the next three months. 26 senior executives and leading academics. Oh, I forgot the academics, they were there too. And industry professionals, so you had you know, the equivalent of your American Bar, Solicitors and Barristers, you had um, you know, our, our data teams and uh, sorry, more foundation, but et cetera. You had not-for-profit organizations supporting consumer advocacy and policy um, rights. We, we had everybody. <laughs> Which is why I said we're only gonna hear 30 claims. Right? We've, only, we've only got three months to run this thing. We're, we're only going to have time to hear 30 claims. We've only had to beg, borrow, and steal some members from court administration. Uh, we can only hear 30. We're clearly overachievers, so this is not happening. So, leveraging the Map Mojong platform for our MVP1, we heard 65 cases. I really tried to stop, and by 65, I was like, enough, please. Please. But what happened was when people got wind of it, they started using it and we started to explain to um, our community about what we were doing, etc. Et 
that uh, the, the interest was actually quite overwhelming and, and there was a lot of desire even from areas outside of small civil claims that actually wanted to participate. And that was not something I was expecting, but getting something from another list related to a, you know, a landlord-tenant dispute saying, oh, I just read your you know, website article about online dispute resolution, when are you, when are you gonna do this for us? That was really, really um, wonderful and exciting. And it also gave us scope for um, looking at other opportunities about how you could apply this type of technology, sourcing capability, and this sort of strategy to other areas of online dispute resolution. And as Donald mentioned, potentially even into the criminal space. So um, I thought that was a, an interesting takeaway. Um, we had 71 uh, parties who participated. And the thing that was interesting about that stat is that we had always traditionally had a very low respondent turnout, but because of the fact that things were now accessible online, we had a significant increase in respondents actually turning up to access their justice rights. So not just the applicants that were lodging the claim, but the respondents. So we've got to remember, as VCAP says quite often, you know, and our members would remind us, um, and it's not just VCAP, right? Every court, every tribunal needs to do this. You have to provide justice services to both the applicant and the respondent, the defendant and, and, and um, the... Plaintiff. Plaintiff, sorry, thank you. Yes, the plaintiff, the law degree would come in handy now. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Nikki Mollard, if you were going to watch so this. If there are 65 cases, wouldn't there be at least two parties for each case? There would be 170? Oh. So or there's some people get sued a lot? No, what would happen is you would lodge the case and the respondent, the other party, wouldn't show up. Mm. So there's a disproportionate yeah, representation between yeah, applicants sure. and respondents. And then there's like a default judgment or something? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And, and 71 would be, um, represents more respondents than you'd ordinarily get without That's ODI? That's correct. Oh, cool. And now we can't, we can't really, you know, we won't have problems about what the number could or shouldn't have been, but we can say in that same window of time, taking another random sample of up to single civil cases, it was statistically significant that there were more respondents attending in an online space than if, if it um, wasn't other. I think there was, what was that great saying from that? There was, there was one uh, dispute about um, uh, childcare fees and payments that happens. I remember yeah, what the- I'm sure you probably remember it better than I do, but it was, you're talking about the woman who said, yes. it's school holidays, I couldn't have come in if I had to turn up in person because I couldn't get childcare. So well, having, it online, having it online meant I could, you know, yeah. log in. And again, that's real. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and to, to appreciate, our small business owners uh, are, are our number one persona. The data was telling us, we, we thought it would be vulnerable Australians or some other um, group. It was actually small businesses chasing up on pet invoices, right? That's often what the disputes are about. Um, and what was really interesting about that insight is that we managed to find a way for them not to have to close the business down, get all the way into the city, pay for parking and so on and so forth, spend the whole day waiting around. I mean, it was actually, not to mention the mental load and the stress and all of that sort of stuff. So it was really interesting to see a statistically significant positive benefit to both parties. Again, in the context of a tribunal or a court, that's a positive thing. You want both parties represented. That demonstrates improved access to justice for the community. The other thing that was really interesting was the settlement rate of cases beforehand. Because again, with the online platform, once people see sort of the evidence and the data in front of them and what they can respond to, any, any commentary, interestingly, cases settle. People pay the invoice or do whatever they need to do to pay the dispute. So not to say the cases don't settle beforehand, I think we just saw an in, increased speed and um, uh, reduced lag of time between when that happened. Again, getting things through that little bit faster and freeing the efficiency. And that all showed up in the results. So. How does that compare to in court? Do you have a third of cases settling out of court also there? So there are probably not as high statistics. I think it was around 10 or 15% of fast track mediations. I'd have to go back and, and look at the numbers, but it, it wasn't um, quite as, I mean, that is still significant, slightly significantly more. I think the difference is the length of time between when you lodge and when you go to court does take some time. So I think, um, it's very difficult to compare apples and apples because our, our process is that much faster as opposed to a, a traditional um, court length of hearings. But one would assume that through this process and the ability to kind of objectively look at things to a platform helps parties to maybe take that time to reflect and observe. But I'm just, I'm just guessing. I think the other thing that's super interesting is anecdotally, anecdotally we've heard people turn up to the courthouse and then 
meet each other on the steps. Yeah. And and and. That's how the majority of the press are yeah. Know yeah. 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 And they settle because they see each other on the steps and they go, look, that, that sort this out. Yeah. Um, and this was a way of actually quantifying that because if the case, if no one turns up, you never know why. So this was a way of kind of saying, actually, if you just get people sort of talking to each other earlier in the process and, and BPAC can assist them to do that, you might be able to settle cases at a much lower cost to government because you don't have to have as many staff involved. And you can also get a better outcome for the citizen where they don't have to turn up and they don't have to go through this legal mold. You can assist them to work with each other a bit more. So that was also what's come in by that side of it. Yeah, I forgot about that. that and, right. and the other thing is that the members, before they start to hear the matter, will actually invite the parties to try to settle the matter. So in, in the 65 cases, there were two of them that settled at the end. Yeah. So here's another opportunity. The, the members are the like the, the judges. judges. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All the special event members and the cabinet members. Ah. Mm. So we were going to open up for a few Q and A's, and we have to do yeah, lots of questions. <laughs> and we have to say thank you, right? I mean, there's a lot of people obviously that make all of this happen. Lots of great people behind the scenes. But you know. Formal, um, CEO. Wait, wait, before you wrap yeah. up, do you, yeah. do you have any screenshots or could we see what the, the platform was like? like? So other than that video, it's such a, that, that's a huge topic. So um, I, I did actually mention to the vendor that um, Modron, um, Nathan Polito, the CEO, mentioned today that he was coming here today. And I sort of uh, hopefully didn't have to twist his arm too hard, but I did say if people are interested, um, would they be able to see and experience the platform? And he's happy to do a demo. Um, the way they run those sessions, though, because, I mean, it's all online, right, is that everyone gets a, um, a login credential and you get to participate in the platform. So that's something of interest to Boston Legal ha Hackers. I mean, I'll take it away and happy to set you up for that. Yeah, there's yeah. two of us. Uh, Brian and I will sue each other uh, <laughs> <laughs> in a mock uh, proceeding. Done, done. But yeah, we'd very much like to see um, what that looks like. It's great. And it's things that, things that are really interesting to sort of play around as party A, party B, and they've got an operator they call the mediator or the member or the judge or whatever you want to call it, plus a, a fourth group called the administrators who might be court administration staff or paralegals at a law firm if you're in arbitration or whatever. Um, the beauty of something like that is you can actually add different people to support party A and B. So you can have all of your lawyers, have all of your translators, um, you know, if it's family matter related or property related, you might have some experts that you might need to get. And they are using this platform in, in real life context, commercial context right now. Um, and all of those things are, are, and again, I got to play around um, on his venue that just kind of completely um, reformatted the platform. And the fact that I didn't need any training, and as you can see, I've got some paper in front of me, demonstrates my ability to really kind of embrace tech. Um, and look, I was easy, easily navigating, um, you know, raising sort of mock forms and mock templates and mock contracts that, you know, the two parties can sign. So um, they're looking at, you know, online payments, they're looking at um, potentially having, um, you know, uh, payment plans so that people can resolve disputes over time. So it, it, in all sense, it was very much a sort of a self-contained platform, which is why it was really exciting to look at the different applications of what could be possible. Mm. I just want to make a quick comment. I don't think we know how many Victorians there are. There ah. are 200,000 claims. Oh, yeah, so another guessing game. How many Victorians? So, just before Bosch. Um, how many Victorians? 5 and a half. <laughs> 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 the population is between 5.5 and, and 6 million. Oh. Yeah, that's what that's going to say. Yeah, it's a high proportion of people using access. Who do we want to thank? Okay, so I'll well, thank you. So thank you, you know, um, the former CEO, sort of Karen Emery of DCAT, she and Donald worked for many, many Carlos hours kind of throwing figures together, so that was great. Um, other members of the supporting team, obviously you've got Turing um, and Chelsea and, and Lynn from Big Six in the audience. Um, we've also got a whole bunch of folks holding down the fort back in Melbourne. Um, the project has ended, of course, so everyone's gone their separate ways. Um, and, you know, amazing support working with some of the academics uh, work as an adjunct fellow in the Sydney Melbourne Cowan Centre. So Dr Cathy Lester, who is the director there, um, was very kind to sort of share some, um, some content with us, which was, which was great. Um, if anyone's interested in sort of learning about how we try and get to bring the community together 
with academia and with practitioners so that we can share and explain what the legal rights are. That's something I'm sure that's important to myself. And so Nick Reading is also working closely with the McDonald's team in the department so I can say a few things to help out. So um, same thing as well, you know, Hannah, who's kind enough to make sure that we had images that actually uh, focused and weren't my blurry eye camera photo with my thumb in the middle. So thank you, Hannah. All right. Now, I was obviously going to open to questions. I just thought I'd get through the next. Okay, so, so um, I'm going to shut the um, video off for yeah. questions. Yep. So, thank um, you, thank you everyone. Yep. Nothing you do, nothing. Thanks, so let that be a lesson to you to come in person if you want um, <laughs> that part. And thank you just very much. Why don't we give a warm round of applause for that. <laughs> okay. Justice, get some.